God and our Father, we thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege of gathering in your presence. Thank you that you with us. We have fellowship with one another and with you. We ask, O oh Heavenly Father, that in your mercy, as the disciples wanted to know where you were staying, and they came and they saw and they interacted with you and they were convinced that you are the Savior. So also in this season, in all our meditation, in all our interaction with you, our conviction may be deeper, our joy may be stronger, our love may be deeper with you. And grant, O oh God, that in everything that we do, your name may be glorified, because we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We have these little sheets in your hand that we hope that we will be able to follow. We started it last Sunday, uh, and we covered um, this topic on the second coming of Christ. We went as far as the item 3-2, where we talked a lot about the um, deceitfulness, the deceitfulness of Satan, the deceitfulness of the man of sin who may mislead us as we wait for the second coming of Christ. Let me emphasize again that the purpose of our study is not to be more clever than somebody else. The purpose is that we may be fully prepared for that coming. That we may be fully prepared for that coming. And part of that preparation is to fulfill our ministry now. So it's not a personal thing, and I will mention one or two of that as we go along. It is the way in which each one of us contributes in making the whole community, the whole community of God's people, ready for his coming. Let, let me say it now. Maybe I will forget when I come to the point. God, Jesus is coming back for his bride. Jesus is coming back for his bride. That bride is not any individual Christian. That bride is the church. So, any one of us that contaminates the community is delaying the coming of Jesus Christ. You are not making it what he would like to come and do. He wants to come and get married to his bride, and he wants to get married to a bride that is prepared, dressed in fine linen, and ready to meet his Lord and husband. As I said last week, we are going to base our study on Matthew 24, Matthew 24. So if you'd like to turn to it, um, Matthew chapter 24. There are a few mistakes in the sheets that you have in your hand, but I will try and correct it as we go along. We have looked at the global alarming events. 
we've looked at the grand deception and in 3.3 we are looking at the great tribulation the great tribulation that's just following what uh, Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 24 this great tribulation uh, Matthew um, divides into two parts Let's take the first part, chapter 24, verse 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But he who stands firm to the end will be He who stands firm to the end will be saved. So, even though that is slightly mixed, with the deception. Again, let me uh, do something almost like an aside. Almost everything that happens as we prepare for this second coming are happening together. One does not start, finish, and the other one, you know, uh, begin. No. They are all happening together. And I'm glad that Within what you have read in verse 11, we see again false prophets who want to deceive. But the essential thing he's talking about is that there will be a great turning away, falling away from God. People, because of the various things that they, that they see, the disasters, the problems, the difficulties, the disappointments, the various things that we would experience, will begin to say to themselves, it's not worth it. It's not worth it. Let me enjoy what I'm enjoying now that everybody else is enjoying. Nobody knows what is happening there. Let me enjoy what I can see. And many people will begin to fall away. And as it says in verse 12, because wickedness, the pride of man, is going to increase, many people's love will grow cold. Many people's love will grow cold. So, this tribulation this persecution, this difficulty that we would encounter will make us so irritable, so offended. Especially, as it says in this passage, especially when our own friends, our own co-worshippers begin to behave, one, in a way that is not appropriate, and secondly, when, as it says, they begin to give us away to those who want to kill us. Now, we don't see much of that now. But if the Bible is true, it's saying that as Jesus prepares to come back, more and more people who worship with us will be our own worst enemies. Will be our own worst enemies. And when that happens, when that happens, it will be easy to justify our anger. It will be easy to justify being very uh, if you like, wicked 
to even those who worship with us. I want to suggest to us that one way of preparing for this difficult time, I don't know whether it will happen in your own time or in my own time. I don't know. We don't know when it will start. Let me suggest that one thing that we can do to help ourselves is to learn now, to learn now, not to be irritated by the wrong behavior of those who are around us. Let's learn not to be too critical and judgmental of other people. Because the time is coming when, whether we like it or not, it will happen. So now that we know, as it were, that many of these signs perhaps are not happening for already, let us learn that when people annoy us in our homes, in our offices, in our relationships, we learn to hold back our irritation, to hold back our anger, to hold back our some ways in which we speak about and to one another so that we will learn all right, to bear to bear difficult times to bear difficult times well, that's the purpose of, uh, of of sharing this with one another the second thing that it says about this great Tribulation, verse 15. Look at verse 15 of chapter 24. So, when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Okay? Um, if you go on then to verse 21. Go on then to verse 21. Sorry. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. You remember that last week you were saying that Matthew says it is possible for the elect to be deceived. Now it is saying it is possible for those who are the elect not to survive the time of tribulation and that it will have been impossible for all of us except that God had cut short the time of tribulation. So we're looking at a difficult time ahead. We're looking at a difficult time ahead. So difficult that any of us may not survive it. If, you, if you're looking at your notes, Daniel 12:1. Daniel 12.1, if we just turn to it, Daniel 12.1 confirms what, or it is what, and that's interesting. If you look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, it says, at that time, Michael, that great prince who protects your people, will arise. There will be a time of distress such as not happened from the beginning of nations until then. There will be a great time of distress. Now, the reason why I, decided, I wanted us to read it is this. Here is Daniel not knowing what was going to happen in the future. 
God gave him this prophecy. And then Jesus, thousands of years later, confirmed it. Thousands of years later, confirmed it. Why am I, why am I stopping to mention it? All of us read our Bibles regularly. Because we are expecting our Lord to come back, let's take what we read seriously. Jesus must have read this prophecy and accepted it for him to say to his disciples that which Daniel said is going to happen. If Jesus took the scriptures seriously, part of our preparation for the second coming is to take scriptures seriously. The second thing that Jesus did to show that he took the scriptures seriously in terms of preparing his disciples for his second coming is to say to them, when Daniel said that there will be a time when the temple will be defiled, when somebody is going to enter the temple and spoil it. I said, look, that is part of the preparation. He knew, he knew that in 168 BC, before he was born, 168 BC, that event took place. That event took place. One of the kings that attacked Jerusalem defiled the temple. And yet, knowing that that had happened, he said to them again, it is going to happen in the future. So when, <coughs> when we read our scriptures, and we read it seriously. The call of God upon our lives is that we will listen and we will obey. We will listen and we will follow. We will listen and we will submit. It is not, a reading of the scriptures is not for fun. It's not to be able to please anybody, but to follow what God says. So Daniel prophesied that it will happen, and it happened in 168 BC. And so Jesus again also prophesied that it is going to happen again, and we'll come to that a bit later uh, when we come to look at the implication of the, uh, of the gospel, of the second coming of Christ for the nation of Israel. So that is what uh, um, the, the, uh, the prophecies uh, should do to us. Now, so we've looked at two things. One, we've looked at the falling away that will happen. We've looked at the distress that is going to happen. The third thing that we want to look at is that this is going to happen because of the activity of the person that the Bible calls the Antichrist. The Antichrist. Um, we don't have the reference here, but let us, let us look at it. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. Last week, we were looking at those two beasts in Revelation chapter 13. The beast from the sea and the beast from the, uh, from the earth. 
Um, <coughs> and we were saying that there were people who were going to try and deceive us uh, with strong, powerful deception and political and economic power. But look at verse 18 of First John chapter 2. It says, Dear children, this is the last hour, and as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. This is how we know it is the last hour. They went out from us, but did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us, but they are going out short that none of them belong to us. Many Antichrists. But then the real Antichrist will come later. Many things that are happening now, all right? The spirit that is against Christ, the spirit that is against Christ is behind them. But the real person or the real system that Satan is going to use to oppose the authority and the power of Jesus Christ has not yet appeared. Has not yet appeared. When he, will he appear? When will he appear? Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Those of us who are familiar with our scriptures, you know that in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel was praying about the release of the children of Israel from the captivity in Babylon. And he had read in the book of Jeremiah, he had read in the book of Jeremiah that it was going to be 70 years from the time of the captivity. So he started pleading with God, Lord, it's almost 70 years. Is this thing going to happen? And God answered his prayer and then gave him another prophecy for the future. Say, said, yes, the time has come. Children of Israel are going to leave Babylon. But much more than that, Something else greater is going to happen in the future. Now, if you look at verse 23, look at verse 23, it says, As soon as you began to pray, an answer was given, which I have come to tell you, for you are highly esteemed. Therefore, consider the message and understand the vision. Now, you think that he was going to talk about the past. No. Verse 24. Seventy sevens are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy. So what's, what is God's answer to Daniel's prayer? Not the past. Not what is going to happen soon. But 77 years ahead, something is going to happen. And what is going to happen? There will be an end to transgression. There will be an end to sin. There will be an establishment of righteousness. Without discussing this extensively, it is clear that he's saying, look, in 70 times 7 years ahead, Jesus 
is going to put an end to the problem of sin. 70 times 7 years ahead. But if you now look at verse 25, look at verse 25. Know and understand from the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the anointed one, the ruler, comes. There will be seven sevens. Just accept my word for it that when sevens means seven years. So seven times seven means 49 years. All right? And he's saying that in 49 years, in 49 years, Jerusalem will be reconstructed. In 49 years, from the time that he was speaking to Daniel, Jerusalem will be reconstructed. And that took place under Ezra and Nehemiah. That took place under Ezra and Nehemiah. Then it goes on. It says, in 62 sevens, it will be time for Jesus to come back, to come and put an end to sin, to wickedness, and establish righteousness. And that also took place. So, 70 sevens. We've had seven, we had 62, 69. All right? We're left with one seven. All right? We are left with one seven times seven. All right? Oh, no, what's one seven years? 69 has gone, we're left with one seven to make the 70 sevens. When will that seven years begin? When will that 70, seven years begin? The Bible does not say. The Bible does not say absolutely clearly. But if you look in verse 27, Look in verse 27. Okay, let's jump it. Verse 26. After the 62 servants, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. In other words, Jesus will die and it will appear as if he has nothing. Okay? The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The people, some people will come, will destroy the city and destroy the sanctuary. That happened in AD 70 when Rome destroyed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple. The end will come like a flood. War will continue until the end. And desolations have been decreed. Now verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many, that is with Israel, for one seven, that is for seven years. In the middle of that seven years, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So, at the end of 69 sevens, Jesus will be cut off. All right? Which we have seen. We must now wait for the person who is going to install in a temple in Jerusalem a defiling of that temple. And in doing so, he will first of all make an agreement with Israel. In the middle of the seven years of that agreement, 
he will install what Jesus said in Matthew 24, when he said, these things will not happen until somebody comes to defile the temple. So we must wait until one, there is an agreement by a man, by a government, by a system, by anything with Israel. Then we must wait for that agreement to be broken. And when that agreement has been broken, we now know that the more intense tribulation that we need to pass through will now happen. So seven years of tribulation, three and a half years of even more intense tribulation, and then the end will begin to come. That seems to be the pattern. That seems to be the pattern. What is the lesson? What's the lesson for us? Before we can draw the lesson, let, let, let me um, let's read something in Daniel 11. Daniel 11. All right. It says, verse 31. His armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. With flattery, he will corrupt those who have violated the covenant. And the people who know their God will firmly resist him. It's amazing what has happened in history. And that is going to be the challenge to us. When the person who defiled the temple 200 years before Jesus Christ, when he did, a family, one family in Israel rose up against the man and fought him to a standstill. One family of five brothers fought against him and re-established the worship in the temple. So when Jesus said that kind of thing is going to happen in the future and he said it to his disciples and we are his disciples, he's challenging us, are we going to be ready to stand firm? That is verse, chapter 11 verse 32. Are we going to be ready to stand firm as people who know their God and resist those who fight against the authority of God? We haven't got more time. Um, How long, how long will this thing be? How long? We have seen already that it's in the middle of the seven years that the uh, agreement will be broken. And if you turn now with me to Revelation chapter 11, Revelation chapter 11. If you turn to Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and I was told, go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there. 
but exclude the outer court. Do not measure it because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for how long? 42 months. How long is 42 months? Three and a half years. Three and a half years minus seven. Three and a half years. The person who is going to defile the temple will begin to do it three and a half years into the agreement. Three and a half years into the agreement. Here, in Revelation 11, God said to John, this vision that I'm showing you, there will be a time when certain people will come and trample the holy city, Jerusalem, for three and a half years. Chapter 12, verse 6. Chapter 12, verse 6. I'm doing this so that God willing, some of us will go and take our Bibles and read it seriously. This, the conclusion in verse 6 is of a situation in which a child was being born. Satan was about to snatch that child, but angels came and took that child away and kept that child for three and a half years. Look at what it says. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her by God where she might be taken care of for 1260 days. 1260 days is the same thing as 42 months. Coming a time of tribulation, great distress, that will expose us to the worst kind of treatment. But, but God has prepared a protection for us. God has prepared a protection for us in those three and a half years of tribulation. In those three and a half years of serious tribulation, God has prepared something good for us. Seven years in all, but three and a half years of intense tribulation. Intense tribulation. Let me jump three, four. Let me do three, four, and go on to three, five, and go back to Matthew 24, Matthew 24, so that we can finish soon. Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31. Matthew 24, 29 to 31. Sometimes we miss, sometimes we miss very simple statements in scripture when we read it. Look at verse 29. Immediately after the distress of those days, we've just been talking about the distress of those days, and then Jesus himself said, immediately after. In other words, the church will pass through this tribulation. But immediately after it, so our deliverance will come after. After. Unless Jesus is wrong. After the distress of those days, Why should we take this seriously? Again, let me say, you know, um, Romans say, and I like a translation I was reading this morning, Romans chapter 5. It says we have peace with God because we have been reconciled to him. But at this peace, even in this peace, we feel secure. 
in suffering. We feel secure. We are glad to suffer because suffering brings endurance. Endurance brings character and character brings hope. So when Jesus is warning his disciples, say, look, there is a big time of distress coming, you know, Paul understood it and said, look, we are secure, we are glad, we are comfortable with suffering because suffering will help us to persevere. And when we persevere, we will have character. Maybe the reason why many of us do not have character is because we do not have that attitude that we are prepared, we are secure, we are okay with suffering. Well, that's fine for now. But the point is, at the time of God's coming, the tribulation is there for us to be able to build character. To be able to build character. So when things are comfortable now, use it to build character. Use it to build perseverance. Use it to be patient. Patient with yourself. Patient with other people. Patient with God. Okay, so that's the first thing. Right? That the time is after the tribulation. Second thing, verse 30, verse 30. The sun will be darkened the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. Heavenly bodies will be shaken. What's going to happen? That means that there will be no sun. Huh? Is that what it means? No. I'm going to leave you to read the reference passages. But simply what it means is this. It is going to be a time of judgment. What the judgment will be like, we don't know. But those who have exalted themselves against the name of Christ, those who have installed themselves as God in the place of our God and as and the Lord Jesus Christ, will suffer punishment. That's what it says. Especially Isaiah chapter 13 uh, and the, the, the passages that I've put down there. That is what it is saying. That's what it is saying. It is going to be a time of judgment. It is not because, you know, some of these films that we see, you know, they say that uh, somebody was uh, going and, uh, is, you know, the, the, something fell from the sky. You know, something uh, happened disastrously. And uh, no, no, no. There is not going to be any physical disaster. But God is going to institute judgment for those who have risen against him. And then thirdly, thirdly, we shall be snatched away. Verse 31. Then he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. Then we shall be gathered to the Lord. That's, in other words, the rapture that we that we all are looking for will happen after the tribulation. After the tribulation. And then, lastly, Christ will appear in all his glory to everybody's view. And he will do so because it is the right time to do so. It's the right time. Now, let me end by saying this. How does this, as I've hinted as we went along, how does it affect the um, nation of Israel? How does it affect the nation of Israel? 
<clears throat> Jesus himself said that a temple will be built and that temple will be defiled. And he was referring to Jerusalem. So, inevitably, something is going to happen that will make somebody build a new temple in Jerusalem, reinstate the Jewish practice of worshiping in the temple, and then break his agreement with Israel. And then trouble will start. Because God intends to fulfill all the unconditional promises that he made to Israel. You are familiar with Abraham's promise. You are familiar with David's promise. But look at Jeremiah 31. Look at Jeremiah 31. We are familiar with, I will give you this land, and it, I give it to your seed. We are familiar with the fact that David will establish his throne, and that is what we are celebrating in this season. The, Jesus being presented as the son of David who will uh, occupy his throne forever. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 to 7. But look at this one, chapter 31. Chapter 31. Let's start from verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother, saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will, give, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. This is what the Lord says. Now, this is the crucial one. You know, the promise is good, very fantastic. Israel will be converted. All right? God is going to do something that will make Israel turn to him. All right? And he will do it himself. But look at the basis of the promise. Verse 35. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will the descendants of Israel ever cease to be a nation before me. Now, that's, that's challenging. Honestly, let me be honest with you, I don't know how this is going to happen. And I don't need to know. I can only trust God's word. God says, I am going to do something to Israel that they will turn towards me. They will obey me. They will begin to live as I wanted them to live. They will come to believe in Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ will have been established as the king of the earth at that time. And Satan will be so bound that they will not be confused. He says, and then he says, only if my covenant with the sun, with the moon, with the sea can be broken, will Israel cease to be a nation before me? Now, you know, don't just worry about how God is going to do it. You know what we can be part of? What we can be part of is to at least spend some time, some time in our life, in our prayer life, and pray for the conversion of Israel. Pray for Israel. Then we will be walking and cooperating with God, cooperating with Jesus Christ, to bring them into the salvation that he has planned for them. 
only if the sun ceases to shine, only if the sea ceases to, 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 to flow, will Israel be destroyed before God. Now that's challenging. And it means that we need to love Israel. We need to love this nation so that we can be part of the millennium. That time of complete peace, healing, joy, everything that you've always looked for. All right, it means the millennium. Only those of us who are raptured with him and who are part of that 1,000 years will enjoy it. For now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. It's our conclusion. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Okay. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and hope of salvation as a helmet. For God has not appointed us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's not the time to be afraid. It's the time to live a self-controlled life as a soldier, a proper soldier, not a proper, not a soldier that does, refuses to fight Boko Haram. All right? Or people who refuse to give soldiers arms. No. Self-controlled soldier, armed with faith, love, and hope. And then also confident saints. Confident saints who know, who are sure, who believe that Jesus Christ will not let them down. Jesus will not let us down in the end. We are appointed for salvation, not for destruction. Appointed for salvation, not for destruction. So, let us take our lives seriously. Self-controlled, but confident. Nothing to be afraid of. In spite of everything that we've said, somebody said there has been 100 disasters this year all over the world. 100 disasters all over the world. But here we are at the threshold of 2021, not because we want to just be alive. Please, not just because we want to be alive. Many of us are going to come here on the 31st of December and we'll be praying, just let me cross over. Why do you want to cross over? Why? It's more important to be alive and be ready than to be alive and enjoying ourselves. And enjoying ourselves. So you by heads and praying. Father, in the name of Jesus, We ask that you yourself, whom you have brought us into fellowship with yourself by your grace. Father, we pray this morning, according to your word, let that grace teach each one of us what to believe, what to do, how to believe, how to live. That our faith will rest not on any man, not on any system, not on any church, but on Jesus Christ and on Jesus Christ alone. Do this, O God, for us because we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.